You know, I wrote an intro for Don, and of course, where is it? Um, I've lost it already. I'm very, very happy to um, introduce uh, our next and final speaker to close out our closing keynote, uh, Don Katz. Uh, Don is founder uh, and CEO of Audible. Of course, we all know Audible as the leading provider of digital spoken audio information in the world. Um, Don has an incredible history of being on all sides of our content value chain. He's been an author um, of five books, um, best-selling books. Um, he's been a contributing editor at Rolling Stone. Uh, and of course, he founded this wonderful company, Audible. Um, so please join me in welcoming Don Katz, our final speaker. All right, so I'm well aware that I'm all, is all that separates you from a drink, so I'll, uh, I'll move it along. But um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been great, great to be here and great to look at these cool new companies, great to hear some of these insights about you know, what's going on in this world. I want to just talk about Audible for a minute just because um, I'm realizing talking to people here, some people don't know how far we've come and certainly how long we've been at it. Um, we've had really a tremendous success. It's a good success story for you know, for the category, for the, the things we're all working on here. Um, and we, what we've done is turned a minor subcategory, sort of a sidecar uh, tethered to books and it, into a digital media experience that's perceived and paid for as more of a daily service. It's much more like Sky to, uh, to our users than it is um, to audiobooks on, on tapes or CDs. Kind of a nice to have product that you uh, you know, got before vacation to keep the kids quiet. It's, uh, it's very different. Um, our average member this year, we expect to take 19 books a year, very much habituated, paying us 15 bucks a month in the States and uh, eight pounds here. Um, and it's for any, basically any body, body, audiobook you want. They obviously buy over their plan because it's a book of the month uh, kind of thing. And um, they buy a la carte at Audibles uh, around the world. They buy through our content through iTunes and via links at, at Amazon. And we've really helped um, elevate the level of performance and make it appear that this is a performance of literature, this idea of literate listening. Um, and that's really the perception of the user. It's the theater for the ear. There's, a, there's an intimacy to being you know, read to. Um, and there's a particular, I think, um, almost Freudian harking back to the pleasures of childhood that with the elevation of the performance art underneath it has really changed this concept. And arguably, these actors are performing some of the greatest scripts in the world, particularly our, you know, our novels. Um, they can spend days on end listening to Kate Winslet do, just recently released uh, her doing Zola. Um, and it's arguably the most immersive content you can buy on the web, days and days on end, largely you know, driving in the car, um, which puts a lot of onus on how we, how the technology works, how the files behave, how the uh, discovery works. Um, in the UK in particular, we've worked really hard to kind of uh, renovate the category from, I don't know if you remember, those awful compressions, these uh, abridged, uh, you know, couple of tape things that were on pegs in, uh, in Smith's, which were really an affront to the literature itself. Um, and they've turned them in, again, to these unabridged performances. We've also applied for a long time really intensive tech development, including commercializing the first digital audio player about four and a half years before the iPod came out in 1997. The device is in the Smithsonian Institution now, making me, among other, for one of the various reasons I feel old. But uh, we, we've helped the, the industry really exit the physical media. And the fact is, it should never have been in physical media. It, if you've ever tried to, like I used to, jog with a bag full of uh, tapes, it's just, it was a, it was a kludgy uh, kind of media. The tapes used to you know, freeze in the winter and melt in the summer. And the fact is, they were in the back of bookstores in small numbers, and uh, you know, they, they, they had no artifact value like the beauty of a book. Nothing told anybody what, <laughs> that this is what I'm like. Um, and they were single play, so they didn't have the recurrent play value of, uh, of audio CDs. So that part of the repositioning was kind of easy. It was just a question of inventing it. Growing very fast, accelerating growth for, for a long time. A very, very large member base is growing over 40% year over year. And we spend more marketing to consumers now than we had in revenue even you know, five years ago. Um, what's amazing is that 46% of the members had never bought an audiobook before. 
um, which just implies even you know, more growth to come. And they relate to the thing as the audible experience as opposed to a particularized audio book you buy you know, one at a time. In fact, the buy rates at retail are kind of one a year. So uh, you can see, see the difference when the habituation sets in. So we invest really heavily. Uh, we invest in a technology platform and infrastructure, all, of, all the elements of how the audio behaves internally. You know, we, we developed, um, and it was, it was technology that was admired in a phone call I got 10 years ago from uh, Steve Jobs, who told me he was bringing out a device. And I think we forget, but when the iPods came out, originally they were for ripping your own music collections and going commercially to audible.com because they had our, our bits in it. Um, we, we, it's, it's about a year and a half later they start iTunes and we still provide them with their long form audio. We invest really heavily in customer care, which I tell all the entrepreneurs, over invest in it if you want to have, have a great experience with the consumer with anything uh, digital. Our customer care, hundreds of people doing this in various parts of the world, we, they got up to a 96% customer satisfaction ranking. We couldn't find any business case study that was that high with the classic are you satisfied question. So they changed the question to did we exceed your expectations and they opened with 83% and have it up to 87%. So we invest in, in the marketing, we invest in the customer shopping experience, all the pipeline stuff. We invest in, uh, in uh, merchandising, selling you know, online to, to, our, to, our, to our many customers. And we're really strong now in global growth. Uh, Audible Germany, Audible UK, we have the Will Lopes and members of the team here, which is over in Hammersmith with 30 people, all growing much faster we, uh, than uh, even in the US. And uh, we just uh, repurchased uh, Audible France from Bertelsmann, and we have an office in Tokyo. 72% of our rights are globally cleared. That's a really great thing to have particularly when a lot of it's English language and the demand for English language is kind of the, the language of the rising middle class around the world. Um, so as Victoria Barnsley was talking about time and the challenges of time to just the, the, you know, the fact of reading, the fact is Audible has succeeded in part because of its relationship to how people look at time. And also the simple fact that in the States, and I'm not so sure what it is here, 105 million Americans drive to work alone. Um, only 119 million drive to work. But if you've ever been in the, scene where the cities where there's uh, HOV lanes and seen them empty, you see that you know, it's true. And there's kind of a, a sanctum of this period of time, hundreds of millions of hours a week, that we fill up with value. And it seemed like a simple idea, but it wasn't quite the way audiobooks were, were marketed or even thought of or positioned in the past. It also related to the fact that after 20 years as a writer, I became frustrated with many things, and so sort of the handwriting on the wall with various elements, particularly my 10,000 word articles in magazines, were going away. But one of the things I realized was that all of my friends from Rolling Stone wrote, I thought, good books for basically the same kind of reader. And there was only so much time that I could, I could, I could write, write as well as I could. I couldn't give my, my readers time. And uh, Audible seemed, seemed to you know, fit the bill. Fact is, if you ask people if they would be happier, more successful in their economic lives, more interesting at the dinner table if they read more books, they tend to say yes. It's just that there's only so much time. Um, now Audible is what you know, millions of people do uh, when they can't read or look at a screen. It's a big part at the time that, that we, we contend to occupy. So it's funny because if, if you think of it, you're thinking of it differently than when you hear people talk about a book or an audio book and even my, my previous life. So, so many things are going great for the company. We were able to uh, sort of uh, you know, play out our missionary and even uh, visionary corporate values in social action. We moved the company to downtown Newark, New Jersey, which is a city in very much in need of a, a urban transformation that's going on. We've made it a huge part of our culture. It's been a really exciting thing to see this kind of missionary culture involved with that. We have, the only way you can be an intern at Audible is to be an inner city uh, school kid, and the only way you can uh, and also we have Audible scholars at college we support and, and mentor. That, that part's been great. And I even got to exit my 10 years as a public company CEO of us being on NASDAQ. That got old after about, it was fun at first, but it wasn't so much fun, fun after a while. And uh, we were bought by Amazon in, uh, in 2008. Very independent, I tell entrepreneurs, if you want to continue to have a missionary culture and stick around and have a lot of fun, um, they're very, very supportive of just uh, maintaining your culture. And we have access to their technology, as do thousands of others of, com of companies, their e-commerce platform. And we also have access to their customers, also like many thousands of sellers of, of many things. Um, 
So with all of that, we actually still have challenges, and many, but the main challenge, I have to say, is ironic. It's a distinct challenge that there's simply not enough audio. There's not enough audiobooks. Um, even though it's clear to us, it's really clear, that there, every good book, every book worth writing, every book worth reading should be in audio. And the fact is, many of the front list, um, of front, front list titles, 80, 90% in some cases, don't go to audio, despite this gaping need that we're creating uh, by, by building this growing business. Um, there's about 113,000 files in the US available, but about 70,000 in their audio books. We invented the first paid podcast, first with Robin Williams and then with Ricky Gervais. We have a lot of other content. But books are really happily the, the bread and butter. But if a member runs out of sci-fi, we lose a member. So it's a, you know, it's a bad thing. Plus, they go deep and they, and they buy a lot. So um, it's not unusual that disruptive invention-led growth outstrips the traditional source of supply. It happened all through the 20th century with major retailers, which was one of the reasons they went into house brands and things like that. Um, but we tried for years, and we did successfully invest with more progressive uh, publishers to try to create lines that we would help, help finance and the like. But it still was not enough. So eventually, we became producers. And now we're by far the largest producer of audiobooks with studios running double shifts. We're a huge employer of actors, which is very much uh, it's something that the acting community is aware of from top to bottom. We even train actors at the Juilliard School and Yale Drama School and the like uh, because of, the, again, the demand. Our headquarters just buzzes with actors um, from you know, Susan Sarandon there a couple of weeks ago to, uh, to a lot of uh, British uh, stars, usually Academy trained. Um, so we tried last year to open the ACX.com. We haven't brought it over here. I'm thinking we will. It's called Audiobook Creation Exchange. It spent a lot of money creating an entire rights platform, which also has an online production facility where you can actually meet online with narrators, studios, audio engineers, and you know, audition them, do a deal. Once it's done, it pops right out into uh, you know, Audible and iTunes. You can get escalating royalties. You can even split the royalties 50% to 90% without, without money having to change hands. And the acting community came out in droves, signed up, and thousands and thousands of people, actors are now being able to do this at home and, and self-edit. Um, but it's been really successful, hundreds and hundreds of great audiobooks. But I would not say that this, what I thought was a no-risk situation, just dump these rights that aren't used, because they're sitting in file cabinets somewhere. They're either with an agent or a publisher. Um, and they just don't, don't come out. So you know, that's, that's been a bit of a frustration. We've got to deal with, uh, with AFTRA. The, kind of hard, hard union in the, in the States head with it for the actors. Um, it's, it's been kind of, kind of interesting. And I, frankly, maybe because I was an author, I think that when a right is created, um, it's supposed to be exploited. And when you invest it with someone else, it's almost a moral imperative to turn that into what it's supposed to be. Studios uh, have 150 people in what they call the business affairs departments in the film industry, and all they do is sell the rights aggressively, they sell the Lithuanian rights if they can. And I'm not so sure that's not something missing from the publishing formula. In fact, from my 37-year perspective, 20 as a writer, it's something that's not done as aggressively and by fewer people than it used to be in the past. So one of my recommendations is to step that up. Um, you know, Audible grew out of a book. Uh, so <laughs> personal note, um, I was supposed to do a book about the digital media revolution, believe it or not, 20 years ago. So in some part, um, my friend John Karp, who's now the publisher at Simon & Schuster in the States, and Ann Godoff, who's a Penguin Press, and my agent, Binky Urban from ICM, had something to do with how Audible got going. I never wrote the book. I spent years paying the uh, advance bank, incidentally. But, uh, but that, that, was, that was OK. And basically, um, I was, there was nothing to write about 20 years ago. I couldn't do my kind of you are there inside the mind of the, uh, the digital media revolution. But I became more adept at understanding signal compression and uh, component miniaturization. And I got together with my college roommate. And uh, we basically started looking at this. When I got to this idea of this compression technology, I said, well, wait a minute. You know, so that means that these tapes and CDs, or done tapes I, I jog with, you could have a virtual inventory and you'd never be out of stock, and you wouldn't have returns, and you wouldn't have to go out of print. I said, no problem. I said, but how are we going to get the, uh, the content off the phone? We didn't know if we'd deliver it to the phone back then or the, or the computer, and into the environments where people would listen. Thus, the audible mobile player, um, which uh, 
came out way too early. I mean, we're talking, you have no idea what it was like to launch a digital media business in 1997. People had no idea what we were talking about. Robin Williams went on the road for us in the early 2000s on television, and Leno and the, the morning shows and everything, talking about this, but people didn't understand downloading. They were afraid of e-commerce. Kind of forget how, uh, how primitive it was at that time. Um, Audible also made sense to me because I was completely obsessed and still am with the music and language, my, uh, and particularly how American literature is a vernacular creation. My mentor and teacher was Ralph Ellison, the novelist, who was a complete student of how American literature was the, you know, the, a function, basically, of how we bragged and joked and sold and lied and lamented in the fields. You know, we, in fact, Stephen Crane was writing like an American when Henry James was still writing like a Brit around the same, same time. And it's, uh, it, it, I always was, was fascinated by that. And then I had the good luck of being here and being Rolling Stone correspondent with my friend Ralph Steadman in the 70s, and I just loved listening to British talk. I would go to Parliament with my, my press pass and just listen, and I came away, th again, thinking, well, two things. One was, don't drink lunch if you want to be successful, which uh, too many of my journalist friends back in the 70s did, I thought, and it, that stood me in good stead. And then the second one was that it reaffirmed that just the sound of well-wrought English sentences can be beautiful and riveting um, just from the, the, uh, the discourse here. So Audible, we set it out, you know, to the oldest of human technology, speech wedded to the newest, and, uh, and it went on from there. So uh, I, I also was, I always thought it was about the fact that I knew that how hard it was to be an author, how hard it was to make money at it. And because I wrote about business sometimes, I also knew how strange it was we could have best-selling books and make as much as, you know, civil servants. And uh, it was, it was uh, something that very few people seemed interested in of my, of my peers, but I was. And I used to say that, you know, I knew every nonfiction narrative storyteller from my generation about a house in America. The Authors Guild, which is the uh, association you have to be, a be published by a major uh, publisher to be in in the States, did a survey not long, a couple of years ago, and it was $6,000 a year in average income for an author. So it's always been a little bit about the author side of me, despite the fact that I'm part of the, uh, the, the distribution group that's innovating and the like, which, as we know, often gets demonized in, uh, in the more intellectual, if not publishing, circles. So uh, I, I think you may have heard that we just announced, uh, and we're announcing at the fair today, um, Audible Author Services, where we've put together a $20 million fund, um, which will pay any author who comes to sign up, got to sign up because we have to know where to pay you and because we have to pay the tax man, um, one dollar for each download, uh, and we have a lot of downloads. And so, uh, you, 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 on the process, we hope to also engage and to show you that we'll give you URLs and samples and the like, and work out systems where we retweet you and things like that, and just to get engaged with the author. Um, it's nothing to do with the royalty stream, it's uh, over and above. And we, um, you know, we really, we really hope it works. It certainly is getting a fair amount of press, and both sides of the Atlantic. So, so why would we do something like this? So uh, the first one is, believe it or not, it's just the right thing to do, uh, because there's nothing more harder, hard or more meaningful than, uh, than writing a book. Um, when I won an Entrepreneur you know, the Year Award, uh, I remember getting up and saying, don't, don't, let me, don't, don't be fooled. There's nothing more entrepreneurial than an author that makes a living in the United States or, or Europe. Um, but, but I also had some precedent. Um, when I was actually on staff at Rolling Stone, I wrote some articles that were published in Reader's Digest. And the first time I got a check, I said, well, wait, I'm on staff and not allowed to get you know, syndication income. And I was told that Mrs. Wallace, one of the founding uh, of founders of the family of Reader's Digest, said that uh, she just believed that it was the right thing to do and take the check. And I remember thinking that. Also, as you well know, in, here in England, uh, there were library circulation fees from the government to authors and still in Canada, I think, to this day. Um, so that was one of the, the other reason is that Authors clearly can help themselves, we saw some of this today, in ways you just you never could before uh, because of the digital era. I was lucky, I would go on these 12 and 14 city tours and I would, um, 
I knew the names of the shopkeepers in the American cities. I, you know, I, I got to know the bookers. I would physically go into the shop, move the books faced out from spine out. I would sign them. I would do, you know, I, I was very much aware of that, you know, just getting the books. In fact, I, I would go to sales. I would go to sales conference. I would always make it part of the deal that I got to go to sales conference and then would drink with the sales guys. And so uh, I, it was all part of that technology. That was technology. It was a way of getting books into stores. The preprinters, and remember that, the little paperback that people started putting out for a while, it was a tremendous way to get more goods into the stores and therefore more, more interface. But this has changed. I was a mid-list author, and uh, both my advances would have been smaller now, and the fact is uh, the, the tour probably wouldn't have been there. The other thing is that I, I met Neil Gaiman in 2004, and we both were on an American Association of Publishers uh, annual meeting uh, event uh, panel. and. Uh, the next year, in 2005, he called me and he said, watch this, basically. And he moved American Gods from like number 60 on the iTunes and Audible list to number one. And he's continued to do this consistently now with his 1.7 million uh, Twitter followers. At one point, he popped the graveyard book above uh, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo at the heyday of uh, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. So the idea of this self-reliant author who really kind of gets what can be done is incredibly compelling. And um, you know, I'm not saying that people should veer from the writing life like I did to, to do, do something like I did, but I kind of think it's kind of over to sit above the marketplace and not row with the, uh, you know, with the others trying to, trying to sell books. A writer like Sherilyn Kenyon, um, she can tweet and do guest appearances on her site and raise sales by 200%. Um, and it's, it's, it's clearly uh, that, um, you know, it's part, it's part of the, the new thing that basically whether or not the publisher and the agent step up to is obviously another question, but here's a case where the author can make a difference and we can prove it and we're hoping to pay them to do it. Um, the, um, you know, the fact of this, you know, the, the, the third reason is just to wake up the authors, hopefully, and the agents particularly, and the publishers to our vast need for audio and our growth, and hopefully, uh, you know, somebody asks the question, well, why am, why am I not making money. We've had people sign up already who last year would have made 28000 32000 extra dollars, um, which, as I remember, it was a, a decent amount of money for an author to add to their income. Um, so, so everything in publishing is controversial. I expect this to be too. Uh, some of my oldest and best friends are editors, publishers, and agents, so, uh, you know, forgive me, but it doesn't have to be quite as controversial as all this that's going on. Uh, you know, there's a little too much time spent at lunch, um, you know, worrying about this. So let me leave you with a brief perspective just on how I look at this technology. And uh, I, was, I was very impressed by Jim Griffiths this morning, and I think some of this relates to what he had to say, um, in particular when it comes to the business of books. Um, if you came to Audible, first of all, you would think it was a computer science, um, you know, lab. It's, uh, it's filled with advanced physicists and people who are building technology. And there's a spattering of people with humanities degrees like, like me and uh, business people and, uh, and the like. But if you took out the customer care group, 55% of the hundreds of people are really intense technology people. And that's because technology just changes everything. Um, it's all, it particularly changed media and anything related to it, including books. And as we heard this morning, it's very true that movable type created written culture and it became the center of the culture. And the fact is, before that, for, what, 2,000 years, it was a vernacular oral culture. The Greeks were set, dead set against uh, text, and the oral culture really drove, drove the world for a long time. And then, you know, books became a business. Um, and as a business, you know, few industries were also, you know, as, as dependent on, on what went on technologically. And then, obviously, as he put it, the electronic media, you know, even, even more so. It's all a function of invention, and uh, usually inventions outside the standing content community of the moment, and usually you know, resisted almost like some play on Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's uh, you know, stages of denying death, denial and anger and resistance, uh, and then eventually, hopefully, acceptance, which I actually saw, thought I saw for the first time in a publishing panel uh, here this, this morning, which was a little bit particularly at Victor's good story of how angry he was, and now he's obviously get, getting, getting with it. The music business was the sheet music business, and boy, did they hate the phonograph. You know, the TV uh, and movies obviously were supposed to kill the radio, and that didn't happen, but the radio industry was powerful enough to make a big difference holding it down. 
my own experience of the denial phase, I was at Rolling Stone when you think about it, how in the world did MTV form around Rolling Stone? I mean, Rolling Stone owned every heart and mind in the, in the world when it came to the journalistic, uh, uh, you know, it was a journal of record. And the same thing happened to another magazine I worked for called Sports Illustrated with ESPN. Um, how does that happen? You know, how is the news in America, not ABC or NBC, but loose, which dominated American news? Well, the old thing, you know, they didn't realize they were in, the old thing, the railroad biz guys not being aware that they're in the transportation business. The best example is the movie industry. Between 70 and 73, when the business was just dying on the vine, and um, they spent just about all the energy and most of the money they had trying to stop two things, the VCR, in court, to the Supreme Court, somebody had to say, uh, actually, just because the movie's small on a screen, it doesn't mean it's not a movie, and that was the end of that, and pay cable. They literally tried to stop both in the tracks, and of course, by the end of the century, their $3 billion business was $33 billion, every single bit of it, on the growth from DVDs and, uh, and, and cable. The music industry, we know that story, and I saw that up close. Um, the only good thing there is they just allowed a world of consumer disaffection to create the piracy market. They were so sort of arrogant about it was that piracy actually helped Audible take off because it taught everybody how to download. Um, the publishing industry grew due to technology, uh, or at least due to technique, from World War II from really a kind of elitist small business into a mass market business. And again, those disruptors were really some nasty guys. I remember hearing people talk about the book club even though it had become this large parcel of the pie, which invented right after World War II and responded to the lack of stores, you know, particularly in Germany and, and other places. Um, you know, the, you, the paperback book was fought off pretty aggressively. It looks like almost t two decades of thinking it was the denigration of the purity that was a, you know, a hardcover book. And obviously, there were some implications of class there because it would massify, you know, massify the business. Um, the discounters in America, it was a bunch of ex-drugstore guys like Crown Books. They didn't like, nobody liked them. And the things people said about the Riggio brothers of BN, I still am embarrassed uh, to remember because they didn't come, they go to the right schools and things. So, you know what, now it's Amazon and uh, it, to me it just is the same and I don't think it's very, very helpful. Business models can really, really change. When we came to England in 2004, 2005, we were told we'd have to make it an all a la carte business, not this massively successful membership business because Brits would not do subscriptions and membership. And uh, I remember thinking, well, that, you know, that's a problem. And now, of course, it's the most digitally imbued uh, society in Europe, except for the Nordic countries, as well as the most digitally penetrated in terms of, uh, you know, device usage and the lot. And the other thought, of course, was that the Beeb served all cultural needs, and therefore, you know, um, you, you were always going to be, be comp competing. And even that is, is really no, no longer the case. So um, I guess I'll close with uh, the fact is that you know, aiding the work of writers who seek to capture the human condition is a cultural good that can be really remunerative too, and I think the Audible story shows that. But obviously maintaining a foothold in the traditional value chain as a daily purpose, um, it, 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 it actually is okay if, if that's a creative process. And as far as I look around, you know, if I was in traditional publishing, I'd step up the editorial services big time because from my long perspective, boy, it's not like it used to be. I would also exploit every right you had all over the world. I'd do away with territorial rights altogether because they just don't work you know, in, the, in the modern age. Um, and you know, it's, it's uh, business models, as Audible showed, can really change for the better. And opportunities abound. And I hope this little success story inspires that pursuit. And thanks. see how much I like you by how long I wrap up. Okay. So, thought I would close things out a little bit here with some of the things I think we've all learned today in sort of rapid fire succession. I think we learned that the internet is God, I believe I heard. I think we learned that user generated content in the video world is crap. Um, I know we learned that there's far more to come from the H Harry Potter franchise uh, than we've seen to date, remarkably. 
um, we learn that mortgages can be paid even by self-published authors. We learn that social reading is really people merchandising, which I found fascinating, and that price pressures will continue to expand. Um, we, re we learned that um, kids' books in the ebook form um, may very well be better born by gamers than by editors. That ebooks are learning to crawl finally in countries like France, Germany, and Spain. We learned that books can sound good and interesting. We definitely learned that Hamish might want to look into Xanax. Thank you. Um, we learned that two to six-year-olds are getting their own web community. Um, and we definitely learned that HTML5 is finally here, thankfully. Um, and my favorite little fact is that as I was looking at Stroob, Scoob, Scooby, Scoob, Scooby, is eBooks backwards? That's a fantastic thing I learned. <laughs> finally, I think we learned a very interesting philosophical conundrum. It's a, in the question form. Does a right exist if no one can hear it? So, thank you very much for coming. I'd like to thank all the speakers and presenters um, and everyone who ran sessions. Um, I'd like to thank all the people at the London Book Fair um, and the conference team, most especially Orn O'Brien, who's had to put up with me for months now. And I want to thank all of you. Thank you.